Section 6 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 1. Ancient Chaldea, Part 6. The chronicle of these fabulous times placed, soon after the abating of the waters, the foundation of a new dynasty, as extraordinary or almost as extraordinary in character as that before the flood. According to Barossus, it was of Chaldean origin, and comprised eighty-six kings, who bore rule during thirty-four thousand eighty years. The first two, Avechus and Camabellus, reigned twenty-four hundred and twenty-seven hundred years, while the latter reigns did not exceed the ordinary limits of human life. An attempt was afterwards made to harmonize them with probability. The number of kings was reduced to six, and their combined reigns to two hundred and twenty-five years. This attempt arose from a misapprehension of their true character, names and deeds. Everything connected with them belongs to myth and fiction only, and is irreducible to history proper. They supplied to priests and poets material for scores of different stories, of which several have come down to us in fragments. Some are short, and serve as preambles to prayers or magical formulas. Others are of some length, and may pass for real epics. The gods intervene in them, and along with kings play an important part. It is Nera, for instance, the lord of the plague, who declares war against mankind in order to punish them for having despised the authority of Anu. He makes Babylon to feel his wrath first. The children of Babel, they were as birds, and the bird-catcher, thou wert he. Thou takest him in the net, thou enclosest him, thou decimatest them, hero Nera. One after the other he attacks the mother cities of the Euphrates, and obliges them to render homage to him, even Uruk, the dwelling of Anu and Ishtar, the town of the priestesses, of the Almas, and the sacred courtesans. Then he turns upon the foreign nations and carries his ravages as far as Venetia. In other fragments the hero Atana makes an attempt to raise himself to heaven, and the eagle, his companion, flies away with him, without, however, being able to bring the enterprise to a successful issue. Nimrod and his exploits are known to us from the Bible. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Almost all the characteristics which are attributed by Hebrew tradition to Nimrod we find in Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and descendant of the Shamash Napishtim, who had witnessed the deluge. Several copies of a poem, in which an unknown scribe had celebrated his exploits, existed about the middle of the seventh century before our era in the royal library at Nineveh. They had been transcribed by order of Ashur Banipal from a more ancient copy, and the fragments of them which have come down to us, in spite of their lacuna, enable us to restore the original text, if not in its entirety, at least in regard to the succession of events. They were divided into twelve episodes corresponding with the twelve divisions of the year, and the ancient Babylonian author was guided in his choice of these divisions by something more than mere chance. Gilgamesh, at first an ordinary mortal under the patronage of the gods, had himself become a god and son of the goddess Aruru. He had seen the abyss, he had learned everything that is kept secret and hidden, he had even made known to men what had taken place before the deluge. The son, who had protected him in his human condition, had placed him beside himself on the judgment seat, and delegated to him authority to pronounce decisions from which there was no appeal. He was, as it were, a son on a small scale, before whom the kings, princes, and great ones of the earth humbly bowed their heads. The scribes had, therefore, some authority for treating the events of his life after the model of the year, and for expressing them in twelve chants, which answered the annual course of the sun through the twelve months. The whole story is essentially an account of his struggles with Ishtar, and the first pages reveal him as already at issue with the goddess. His portrait, such as the monuments have preserved it for us, is singularly unlike the ordinary type. One would be inclined to regard it as representing an individual of a different race, survival of some very ancient nation which had held rule on the plains of the Euphrates before the arrival of the Sumerian or Semitic tribes. His figure is tall, broad, muscular to an astonishing degree, and expresses at once vigor and activity. 
His head is massive, bony, almost square, with a somewhat flattened face, a large nose, and prominent cheekbones, the whole framed by an abundance of hair, and a thick beard symmetrically curled. All the young men of Uruk, the well-protected, were captivated by the prodigious strength and beauty of the hero. The elders of the city betook themselves to Ishtar to complain of the state of neglect to which the young generation had relegated them. He has no longer a rival in their hearts, but thy subjects are led to battle, and Gilgamesh does not send one child back to his father. Night and day they cry after him. It is he, the shepherd of Uruk, the well-protected. He is its shepherd and master, he the powerful, the perfect, and the wise. Even the women did not escape the general enthusiasm. He leaves not a single virgin to her mother, a single daughter to a warrior, a single wife to her master. Ishtar heard their complaint, the gods heard it, and cried with a loud voice to Aruru, It is thou, Aruru, who has given him birth. Create for him now his fellow, that he may be able to meet him on a day when it pleaseth him, in order that they may fight with each other, and Uruk may be delivered. When Aruru heard them, she created in her heart a man of Anu. Aruru washed her hands, took a bit of clay, cast it upon the earth, kneaded it, and created Babani, the warrior, the exalted scion, the man of Nanib, whose whole body is covered with hair, whose tresses are as long as those of a woman. The locks of his hair bristle on his head like those on the corn-god. He is clad in a vestment like that of the god of the fields. He browses with the gazelles, he quenches his thirst with the beasts of the field, he sports with the beasts of the waters. Frequent representations of Ibani are found upon the monuments. He has the horns of a goat, the legs and tail of a bull. He possessed not only the strength of a brute, but his intelligence also embraced all things, the past and the future. He would probably have triumphed over Gilgamesh if Shamash had not succeeded in attaching them to one another by an indissoluble tie of friendship. The difficulty was to draw these two future friends together, and to bring them face to face without their coming to blows. The god sent his courier, Sadu, the hunter, to study the habits of the monster, and to find out the necessary means to persuade him to come down peaceably to Uruk. Sadu, the hunter, proceeded to meet Ibani near the entrance of the watering-place. One day, two days, three days, Ibani met him at the entrance of the watering-place. He perceived Sadu, and his countenance darkened. He entered the enclosure, he became sad, he groaned, he cried with a loud voice. His heart was heavy, his features were distorted. Sobs burst from his breast. The hunter saw from a distance that his face was inflamed with anger, and judging it more prudent not to persevere farther in his enterprise, returned to impart to the god what he had observed. "'I was afraid,' said he, in finishing his narrative, and I did not approach him. He had filled up the pit which I had dug to track him, he broke the nets which I had spread, he delivered from my hands the cattle and the beasts of the field. He did not allow me to search the country through. Shamash thought that where the strongest man might fail by the employment of force, a woman might possibly succeed by the attractions of pleasure. He commanded Saidu to go quickly to Uruk, and there choose from among the priestesses of Ishtar one of the most beautiful. The hunter presented himself before Gilgamesh, recounted to him his adventures, and sought his permission to take away with him one of the sacred courtesans. "'Go, my hunter, take the priestess. When the beasts come to the watering-place, let her display her beauty. He will see her, he will approach her, and his beasts, that troop around him, will be scattered. The hunter went. He took with him the priestess. He took the straight road. The third day they arrived at the fatal plain. The hunter and the priestess sat down to rest. One day, two days, they sat at the entrance of the watering-place, from whose waters Ibani drank along with the animals, where he sported with the beasts of the water. When Ibani arrived, he who dwells in the mountains, and who browses upon the grass like gazelles, who drinks with the animals, who sports with the beasts of the water, the priestess saw the satyr. She was afraid and blushed, but the hunter recalled her to her duty. It is he, priestess. Undo thy garment, show him thy form, that he may be taken with thy beauty. Be not ashamed, but deprive him of his soul. He perceives thee. He is rushing towards thee. Arrange thy garment. He is coming upon thee, and receive him with every art of woman. His beasts which troop around him will be scattered, and he will press thee to thy breast. The priestess did as she was commanded. She received him with every art of woman, and he pressed her to his breast. 
Six days and seven nights, Ibani remained near the priestess, his well-beloved. When he got tired of pleasure, he turned his face towards his cattle, and he saw that the gazelles had turned aside, and that the beasts of the field had fled far from him. Ibani was alarmed. He fell into a swoon. His knees became stiff because his cattle had fled from him. While he lay as if dead, he heard the voice of the priestess. He recovered his senses. He came to himself full of love. He seated himself at the feet of the priestess. He looked into her face, and while the priestess spoke, his ears listened. For it was to him the priestess spoke, to him, Ibani. Thou who art superb, Ibani, as a god, why dost thou live among the beasts of the field? Come, I will conduct thee to Uruk, the well-protected, to the glorious house, the dwelling of Anu and Ishtar, to the place where is Gilgamesh, whose strength is supreme, and who, like a Urus, excels the heroes in strength. While she thus spoke to him, he hung upon her words. He, the wise of heart, he realized by anticipation a friend. Ibani said to the priestess, Let us go, priestess, lead me to the glorious and holy abode of Anu and Ishtar, to the place where is Gilgamesh, whose strength is supreme, and who, like a Urus, prevails over the heroes by his strength. I will fight with him, and manifest to him my power. I will send forth a panther against Uruk, and he must struggle with it. The priestess conducted her prisoner to Uruk, but the city at that moment was celebrating the festival of Tammuz, and Gilgamesh did not care to interrupt his solemnities in order to face the task to which Ibani had invited him. What was the use of such trials, since the gods themselves had deigned to point out to him in a dream the line of conduct he was to pursue, and had taken up the cause of their children? Shamash, in fact, began the introduction of the monster, and sketched an alluring picture of the life which awaited him if he would agree not to return to his mountain home. Not only would the priestess belong to him forever, having none other than him for husband, but Gilgamesh would shower upon him riches and honors. He will give thee wherein to sleep a great bed cunningly wrought. He will seat thee on his divan, he will give thee a place on his left hand, and the princes of the earth shall kiss thy feet." the people of Uruk shall gravel on the ground before thee. It was by such flatteries and promises for the future that Gilgamesh gained the affection of his servant Ibani, whom he loved for ever. End of Part 6 Read by Professor Heather and By For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org